Welcome to Sovereign Finance, the show that connects the dots between personal finance, global finance trends, and deep human history. Tune in every week to demystify the money puzzle and protect your interests in a turbulent world. This is Rob Drummond. I'm your host of the Sovereign Finance Podcast. I'm here with Derek Dearden. How's how's it going, Derek? Great, thanks, Rob. And you? Yeah, I'm okay. I've got a bit of a sore throat, so I apologise to everyone listening if I have a coughing fit. So I'll try my best. But we're here to, today to talk about to talk about big numbers, about millions and billions and trillions. And I was thinking just before the call, it's like when someone mentions a billion to me, my brain goes, "Oh, that's that's like a few million." Whereas I think I think actually comparing a million and a billion, it's like comparing a puddle to like an Olympic sized swimming pool, I think. That <clears throat> that is about it. I mean, one way uh that I can visualize it, I mean we think of a million as a as a largely unimaginable number. Uh and then when when as you say, the the mental image a lot of people have is that a billion's rather more than that. But to, to get an idea, if you, if you had it in uh, 50 pound notes, for instance, you could fit a million pounds in a, in a largish briefcase. Uh, a billion pounds in 50 pound notes, tightly packed, would, would take up a, a, a 40 foot, um, a 30 foot uh, shipping container packed. So that gives you an idea. And then. <clears throat> To move on from there to a trillion, you'd need uh, a freight train of boxcars six kilometres long. That's like one of those trains they have in Africa, isn't it? That, that you see like yeah. going across the horizon and you, you can't see from one end to the other. But you even So that gives you an idea of, of the sort of scale as you go up through these numbers. And... Uh, I think a more useful way of envisaging it and getting a handle on what the numbers actually mean is that uh, suppose uh, one takes the example of uh, a person who's earning £25,000 a year uh, and they've got a working lifetime of 40 years, say, from from their early 20s to their early 60s. Uh, Now, their income over the course of that working life would be a million pounds. 25,000 times 40. Uh, And so that gives you a handle. Then when you go up to a a billion, you're talking about the lifetime earnings of that, shall we say, typical typical worker. Uh, You're talking about a thousand of those people or one person for a thousand lifetimes, whichever way around you want to look at it. So, uh, and then if you go to a trillion, it would be the earnings of that person uh, over a million lifetimes, or if you like, a thousand lifetimes of a, of a thousand people, or a million people. So the entire earnings of an entire city would be a trillion. So that when we look at a minute in a minute at uh, some of the numbers that are bandied around. Uh, in terms of finance, we can bring it down. For instance, uh, if you said, well, Bill Gates' net worth is apparently, uh, last time I checked, it's probably gone up since then, was $114 billion. And um, it's, it's interesting. I was um, The yardstick of enormous wealth used to be the Rothschilds. And I, I read recently that the, uh, the, the net worth of the Rothschild family is about a billion. So, and, and of course, nobody knows exactly how these numbers are computed anyway. But, but certainly uh, the entire dynasty that was the byword for plutocratic wealth for the, for the last two or three centuries um, pales into insignificance beside the wealth of uh, basically the, uh, the internet uh, billionaires. And Bill Gates isn't even, you know, one of the richest, I think, as well. Right? No, no, I, th- I think Bezos is a lot richer. Anyway, so um, so uh, as I say, uh, if you if you look at um, 
Bill Gates with his estimated net wealth, as I say, the last time I looked, of $114 billion. That's the equivalent of the lifetime earnings of all of the people in a, a, a sizable city, you know, the, the size of Southampton or, or Portsmouth. And uh, so let, let's look at uh, some other things. How long does it take to earn a million? I, I've already said that typical worker, and I mean, you might quibble whether 25 is a good average income to take up. So you might end up with uh, 2 million or or half a million if you if you make different assumptions about that. So but the, the, the typical worker earning £25,000 a year, it, it'll take an entire lifetime. Uh, the chief executive of an average Fortune 500 corporation, it would take about five weeks to earn a million pounds. Um, for, um, for a top football player, it might take about nine days. And for the world's top financiers, they earn a million pounds about every six hours. So let's say, let's say every day. I'm beginning to think that I'm in the wrong career. <laughs> I think you're very safe. Anyway, um, so let's have a, a look at a few examples in the million. Uh, a million pounds is r- roughly what it would t- take to arm three Reaper drones with, with two bombs and two Hellfire missiles on each one. One and a half million, this is in dollars actually, one and a half million dollars, but dollars and pounds are getting very close to the same thing <laughs> these days. Um, one and a half million uh, dollars is the cost of one cruise missile. So every time one of those is launched, uh, that's uh, a lifetime and a half of uh, typical person's earnings. I saw a meme actually a few weeks ago where each each of those missiles, it's each time it's fired, it's fired by someone who, who earns the amount it costs to make that missile, he earns that in a year, and he's firing yeah. he's firing it at someone who hasn't got a hope of earning that in their lifetime. Extraordinary business. <clears throat> Twenty million is the cost to upgrade one nuclear warhead, and the United States is currently planning to upgrade its entire stock of three thousand warheads. Eighty-five million is the cost of one intercontinental ballistic missile. So apart from the 20 million pounds that it cost for the warhead, uh, it, it, it cost four times as much again for the entire missile and and the cost of fueling it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if we, if we uh, look at um, numbers of people, a million people is the number of lives that could be saved every year if clean water and sanitation were available to them. So some things in the billions, uh, I came across a figure of eight billion dollars for the cost of a nuclear submarine. It, it appears, uh, looking around, that there's a wide difference in estimates of the cost of that, and it varies a lot from country to country. Once again, so again, that's uh, the lifetime earnings of 8,000 people every time there's a nuclear submarine launched. The, the Europeans spend $10 billion a year on, on ice cream. The uh, 10 billion is actually all it would cost to provide clean water and sanitation to every person on the planet. And that would be pretty much a one-off cost. But allegedly, we can't afford that. But yeah, we can't afford that, no. And um, apparently the cost of weapons that have been sent to Ukraine is estimated at 30 million, 30 billion, sorry, we're still in the billions, 30 billion and obviously counting. And uh, it's unclear to me uh, where where that's coming from. I would imagine that it's coming it's, from it's coming from your tax. it's coming from your council tax. You know all, all, <laughs> all the bins that they don't empty and all of the potholes in the road. It's like, well, that's where it's going. Yes. Okay. So moving on to trillions. Um, apparently, the net assets owned by the ten richest individuals in the world add up to one point seven trillion. Um, that's those. Uh, people with multiple billions and multiple tens of billions and multiple hundreds of billions by the time you've just got down to the the top 10. Uh, Eight trillion is the cost of American military expenditure during the Cold War. Uh, Once again, uh, I'm not sure whether that's uh, translated into contemporary value of dollars. 
or, or whether it was uh, dollars as they were spent over that period, and uh, if so, in in current uh, value of the currency, it would it would be rather larger than that. So we're not sure where it's indexed to, but it's still a lot. The U.S. spent five and a half trillion building nuclear weapons between 1940 and 1996. The annual um, gross domestic product of the United States is 18.6 trillion and the US federal debt is 33 trillion so in round figures it's uh, it's almost uh, double mm. uh, the the annual if you like total revenues of everybody in the United States which indicates that it's well into unsustainable territory as we've indicated when we were discussing various other aspects of the current global finances. And um, the total US debt covering not only federal debt, but uh, state and municipal debt and individual private debt uh, is now over 93 trillion. Now, um, the three biggest uh, fund managers in the world, BlackRock, Vanguard and, Vanguard and State Street, uh, between them have got 22 trillion of assets under under their control and uh, that's something that is is we'll probably have a separate analysis of in a different conversation because it's very interesting to see what a mockery this makes of the justification for certain aspects of the the current world financial arrangements that um, we have competition for instance, between Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola or between Apple and Microsoft. Yeah, I'd like to talk separately about David Webb's book as well, The um, the Great Taking, get your perspective yeah, on that. Yeah, uh, so exactly. And, uh, okay, a, a few more numbers and then I'll, I'll reflect on something else. So 76 trillion is the total value of goods and services traded in the whole world. That was a figure for 2014. So uh, it's, it's probably a bit larger. But you, you notice that even the entire trade of the, uh, of the whole world is not as large as the total indebtedness of the, uh, the American population on all its levels. And... Uh, an astonishing number of 5,400 trillion, that's 5.4 quadrillion, is the total value of financial derivatives that are held by uh, by banks and other financial institutions. So uh, that is... I think we need to do a separate episode on derivatives, don't we? <laughs> yes, exactly. But ultimately, those are claims on other kinds of more tangible assets like uh, stocks and shares and bonds and real estate and so forth. So <clears throat> obviously, um, obviously, 90% of that at least is, is stuff which is exists in theory and yet there aren't any actual assets that could be translated into those numbers to justify it. It's almost like an accounting profit rather than a real profit. Yeah, well, uh, as I say, we'll have an entirely separate conversation looking into what is meant by various types of deliveries, <coughs> derivatives, and what they are, and, and, and what legitimate uses they have, and also some of the more questionable uses. And in fact, nearly all of those, in effect, are forms of gambling in that it's a zero-sum game. Uh, as we as we indicated when we were doing the the segment on the nature of wealth, um, wealth is something tangible that's created by purposeful, intentional activity on the part of entrepreneurs, large and small. Whereas the the financial world has increasingly existing in a world of its own entirely. So I, th I think that's about all that I wanted to say on this topic for one day. My uh, my question is, it's like so for, uh, at an individual level, why is it important? Uh, it's it's very interesting all of the examples, but why is it important that people understand these numbers? Well, <clears throat> I think it's important because 
Otherwise, uh, the every time there's an announcement about this, we've got no context, so the information simply washes over us. Yeah, we're just sending another X many billion to Ukraine or whatever. Right? Exactly, yes. Um, I, I, I think there's two things. I mean, one is to put it in perspective in human terms, uh, and the other is to look at the... I, I, I think one of the things which is heartening is we realise how readily soluble are the, the apparently insoluble problems of the world, raising everybody out of poverty. I mean, you see that uh, what it would take to, to do that, to, to make sure that people um, have the most basic level of ingredients for a healthy life, is, is something that uh, is minuscule in in the in relation to money that is already flying around into completely negative. I think this is what people want as well. Like we want a good quality of life. We want you know a stable monetary system. We want you know reliable agriculture based on sustainable soil practices. We want to be left alone to live to live good lives. Um, I think that's what, what people want. Yeah. Well, let, let's see whether things are going to go from bad to worse or whether uh, we're going to reach some kind of tipping point and evolve into the kind of world that actually does work for everybody. I, I, I'm still a believer in the fact that this is possible. Mm. I also like, it, it depends on what time of day you ask me uh, as, as, <laughs> as, to, as to what I think about that. But, yeah, we shall see. Okay. Good. We'll leave this one here. Thanks, Derek. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ram. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sovereign Finance. For more episodes, transcripts, in-depth articles, and the community, please take a minute now to subscribe free at sovereignfinance.substack.com. See you next time.